and welcome. So the Vatican have changed the criteria for establishing whether an event is supernatural or not. The last time they did this was under Pope Paul VI in 1978, and the time for that, somewhere way back in the 16th century. So you might have thought that the 1978 rules stood a chance of lasting a little longer, but they haven't. So what lies behind this? One of the most compelling attractions of being a Catholic is the immersion in the supernatural. The church was birthed with the miracle of the resurrection. It was launched with the miracle of Pentecost. And the old pagan gods of the Roman Empire gave way before the supernatural potency of the sub-apostolic church. And despite the best efforts of schismatics down the ages, God has renewed and refreshed his church with infusions of the mystery of the miraculous century after century after century. Whereas Protestantism, which set out to renew the church, but in a different way, on a different basis, and ended up, in fact, splitting it into thousands of tiny groups, has increasingly succumbed to either a dull Enlightenment rationality or the hyper-hysteria of Pentecostalism. But in the Catholic world, the apparitions of Our Lady, Mary, Theotokos, the Mother of God, remain one of the most powerful tools of the renewal of piety, of a call to repentance, and the deepening of our faith. But, of course, the supernatural is double-edged. It does present us with authentic interventions, but equally with distorted and sometimes even diabolic phenomena. It is a truism, after all, that evil has the capacity and the policy of presenting itself as good. It's equally true the supernatural can be mimicked by the human imagination and human skills. Trickery. So the Catholic Church has taken the task of discernment with the utmost seriousness and a great deal hangs on being able to tell good from evil, the authentic from the illusory. We ourselves need to pray for the gift of discernment between good and evil and we need the Church to exercise that gift on our behalf. So one of the reasons for revisiting the rules of 1978 are the developments in social media. The new norms point out quite rightly that social media works to catapult ideas, experiences and news into the public space with unparalleled speed. And one of the consequences of, the, of this is the loss of space to think, to pray, to test and to evaluate. So if we look at the new norms from a practical perspective, we have to admit they offer some sensible reasons for being reviewed now but as you might suspect there are other perspectives which raise more complex issues and which honestly threaten to cause the faithful some anxiety what might these be well the first i think is that in a careful analysis of the supernatural the document that the vatican gives us begins by rightly pointing out that even authentic episodes can become tainted by abusers. It then continues sensibly, and I quote, when considering such events, one should not overlook, for example, the possibility of doctrinal errors, an oversimplification of the gospel message, or the spread of sectarian mentality. Finally, there's the possibility of believers being misled by an event that is attributed to a divine initiative, but is merely the product of someone's imagination the desire for novelty, tendency to fabricate falsehoods, mythomania, or an inclination towards lying. Well, all that's true if overcautious, but we should be overcautious. That's the right way to approach things. However, and interestingly, and even oddly, the Vatican document fails to mention the additional and perhaps more dangerous possibility of diabolic impersonation. And it's this absence of the full perspective of the supernatural that leads leaves the reader with the unsettling feeling that if the authors of this document in the Vatican feel too uncomfortable even mentioning the possibility of the devil and diabolic interference, well, then the people who wrote it and the people who staff it may not be sufficiently well 
theologically or spiritually qualified to tell the difference between the authentic, what we might call the anthropologically mimetic, the tricksters, and the satanic. At one level, changing the categorizations available as they did so that the possibility of authenticating a private revelation or an appar apparition no longer exists, restricting themselves to saying, we don't see anything wrong with it, but we're not going to promote it, might be arguable on a pragmatic basis. Heaven intervenes seldom in that public way, and most phenomena carry a level of ambiguity with them. It may very well be that Nihil Obstat, there is no obvious objection, is an appropriately circumspect response from the centre. And it's been pointed out to me, of course, that the intractable problem of Medjugorje may prove so difficult for the authorities one might want to have some sympathy for them, because they're faced on the one hand with a highly politicised ultra-nationalistic context, a problematically long time scale, and a library of messages at Medjugorje that really seriously vary in content and in form. On the other hand, with enormous numbers of passionate pilgrims who want to publicise their joy and experiences at Medjugorje, that range from the profound conversion to intense spiritual renewal, we have to take that seriously too. And if these new categories are intended to allow the Vatican to sidestep a problem, what do we do about Medjugorje, what do we say about it, to which there is no obvious solution, well, one can be only sympathetic. However, it's an old legal aphorism <clears throat> that hard cases make bad law. And the whole strategy of changing the rules for one apparition, if it was one, wouldn't be sensible if that was the main cause. <clears throat> but maybe there are other causes. When heaven does intervene authentically, it's usually because something's wrong and needs putting right. Many of the Marian apparitions, ranging from those like Fatima, which have been fully authenticated, to Akita in Japan or Quito in Ecuador, have at their centre a powerful rebuke from Our Lady, mainly aimed at the clergy and senior prelates, for having compromised, distorted, or even repudiated the faith. So you don't have to be deeply cynical to think that it might be a little too convenient for those who are at the target of the Marian call to repentance, the Vatican, the hierarchs, the progressives there, to slip into what becomes a convenient place of metaphysical, metaphysical agnosticism. Oh, we don't know. Who knows? We're not going to tell you whether we believe in it or not when it comes to assessing the validity of the intervention itself, the apparition. We ought to allow Our Lady to speak for herself, <clears throat> so that we can judge too the provenance of some of these words. What did Our Lady say at the apparition of Quito in Ecuador? Let me set the context. It was early in the morning of January the 21st in 1610. The archangels St. Michael, St. Gabriel and St. Raphael appeared to a mother, Mariana. Then Our Lady appeared to her and predicted many things about the times we're in now. And this is part of what Mariana afterwards described as having been told. She's quoting Our Lady. See what you make of it. Quote, I make it known to you that from the end of the 19th century and shortly before the middle of the 20th century, the passions will erupt and there will be a total corruption of custom, of morals. They will focus principally on the children in order to sustain this general corruption. Woe to the children of these times. It will be difficult to receive the sacrament of baptism and also that of confirmation. And as for the sacrament of matrimony, it will be attacked and deeply profaned. The Catholic spirit will rapidly decay. The precious light of the faith will gradually be extinguished. And added to this will be the effects of secular education, which will be one reason for the dearth of priestly and religious vocations. Our Lady goes on, says 1610, remember. The sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed and despised. 
and the devil will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way. He will labour with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation, and he will succeed in corrupting many of them. And these depraved priests, who will scandalise the Christian people, will make the hatred of bad Catholics and the enemies of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church fall upon all priests. Further, in these unhappy times, there will be unbridled luxury. And this will ensnare the rest into sin and conquer innumerable frivolous souls who will be lost. Innocence will almost no longer be found in children nor modesty in women. In this supreme moment of need, the church, the one who should speak, will fall silent. Our Lady told Mother Mariana these apparitions will not become generally known until the 20th century. The church will fall silent. Is that what these new guidelines have managed to achieve? The church will not pronounce on the authenticity of the apparitions. It will effectively fall silent. What did Our Lady say at Akita in Japan where she appeared to a nun who had been a Buddhist until her forties but became a Catholic nun and was profoundly deaf and during these revelations her deafness was miraculously healed. This is at Akita. I was, what was I? I was probably about 17 when this took place, though I knew nothing about it at the time. Our Lady began by saying, each person in this community of sisters is my irreplaceable daughter. Do you say well the prayer of the handmaids of the Eucharist? Then let us pray it together. And Our Lady went on, most sacred heart of Jesus, truly present in the Holy Eucharist, I consecrate my body and my soul to be entirely one with your heart being sacrificed at every instant on all the altars of the world and giving praise to the Father, pleading for the coming of his kingdom. Please receive this humble offering of myself. Use me as you will for the glory of the Father and the salvation of souls. Most Holy Mother of God, never let me be separated from your divine Son. Please defend and protect me as your special child. Amen. Well, it's a rule of thumb that prayers for repentance are unlikely to be the creation of human trickery and most unlikely to be diabolic interference. After all, what has the devil to gain from repentance? When this prayer was finished, the heavenly voices said, pray very much for the Pope, for bishops and priests. Since your baptism, you've always prayed faithfully for them. Continue to pray very much, very much. And then, at a later date in Akita, Our Lady said this, here's a warning. As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one that has never been seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful and the survivors will find themselves so desolate they'll envy the dead the only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son each day recite the prayers of the rosary and with the rosary pray for the pope the bishops and the priests now here's the thing that rings true particularly even more so for me she goes on the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sin increases in number and gravity, 
there will no longer be pardon for them. With courage, speak to your superior. He will know how to encourage each one of you to pray and to accomplish works of reparation. You won't be surprised to know that it was the experience of encountering the apparitions and the extraordinary power, and it seems to me to be undeniable authenticity, that drew me into wanting to be a Catholic. It's very odd indeed that the people who've put together these new guidelines seem unwilling to respond publicly to some of these extraordinary interruptions in human history designed to warn us and to save souls. And in terms of the mechanics of who gets to say whether these apparitions are real or not, permission for that has been withdrawn from the local bishop. So it is a bit odd that under a Pope who unremittingly lets it be known, he wants a climate of mutual accompaniment, interdependent, reciprocal, reciprocal synodality, to remove the apostolic responsibility from the local bishop and restrict the power to recognise these events to himself. It's a surprise. Of course, the local bishop and his advisers are much more likely to know the full context in which the phenomena are taking place, and also the consequences for good or ill that flow from the apparition or the supernatural event itself. So why would the Vatican want to remove the responsibility and the authority from the local bishop and restrict it to the centre, the people who write the documents, the Pope himself? In this way. Within the document the new norms allow the Vatican to retrospectively change the recognition and the affirmation of an event. Imagine what would happen if the Vatican suddenly let it be known it wasn't quite so sure about Fatima, having been sure. To do something like that would be disastrous for the confidence of the laity and if there is a universal complaint about the present pontificate, it is the justifiable concern that Pope Francis has brought unnecessary, uncatholic ambiguity from the top of the church downwards and flowing from that in various areas of Catholic life, something approaching chaos. Now, chaos and ambiguity are not recognised as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. St Paul has a different list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, yes. Chaos, no. Ambiguity, no. What are the implications of that? Well, in circumstances where the present senior hierarchy appear under-equipped to practice discernment adequately, about their own ministry. These new norms, as they've been produced, will not easily deepen the lay confidence of Catholics in the relationship between the hierarchy and the rest of the church. The rest of the church looking for guidance and sustenance in our prayers and our judgments as we seek the renewal of the church in a time of crisis and the proper application of the gift of the Spirit, discernment, so that we can know the difference between the prophetic voice that comes authentically from heaven and people who would like to deceive us, or perhaps worse, the demonic impression of the good, but actually providing us with something less wholesome and less holy, and instead of renewing and strengthening the church, poisoning and deceiving it. We need to know the difference and we need a Vatican that is able to know the difference and has the courage to tell it definitively.